That's the picture we got. 61% who really didn't care one way or the other, 17% in favor, 22% against. And that's the two different pictures of public opinion side by side. Overwhelming majority right here, overwhelming apathy right there. And if you had to think about it very carefully, what do you think is a more realistic thing? How many people do you think are out there, you know, working all charged up about the issue of whether we should recognize Cuba? If you don't live in Miami, you probably don't care a whole lot. But, or that's not quite the same, say, but, you know, most people have got so many other things going in their lives that recognition of Cuba is probably not too high on their own. So, this is a better way of doing it. Okay. So, the conclusion was that if you got permissive opinion, which I, is kind of like the whim of the public, if you say to me, oh, I think we ought to do it, but I don't care if we do that, I'd say that's kind of a whimsical opinion. And people are not upset if the opposite happens to what they prefer, or they don't know when asked about a question, they don't have an opinion. Um, essentially, they permit their representatives to make the decision. Directive opinion <laughs> is closer to what we would think of as the will of the public, the will of the people. Something that says, I want that to happen, and I'm upset if I don't. Now, I don't know what upset will translate into. Does it mean it will translate into people writing letters, getting out there? We don't know yet. This is kind of a beginning way of looking at it. But at least the concept of directive versus permissive opinion is an important one if we're going to try to understand what's going, you know, what's going on. Uh, most public opinion pollsters don't ask the question. No, no one asks the question, actually, beyond those experiments that I know about whether um, people would be upset. But sometimes media pollsters will ask the question about whether people feel strongly or not strongly about an issue. But typically what they'll do is they'll combine the strongly and not strongly and say X percent support and X percent oppose. And then maybe later down in the paragraph they'll say, oh, by the way, X percent feel intensely and so on. But they won't know what that means. So what? So what does the intensity mean? So what Andy Smith, graduate here, and I are doing for a paper that we're going to be giving in April, American Association of Public Opinion Research in May, we ran some experiments. He was director, uh, and so I can work with him as our director and friend, and so on. So we put some questions on it to try to figure out what does it mean when people say strongly and not strongly compared to when people say upset, not upset? So can we treat people who say, I feel strongly about it, as people who would be upset, and people who say not strongly as people who wouldn't be upset, or not? That was kind of what we were trying to do. And when we did that, what we essentially came up with was the fact that people who felt not strongly also said they weren't upset. We asked both questions. And people who said they felt strongly, most of those people said they would be upset. But sometimes even the group of those people would say that they wouldn't be upset. So it meant that we could go ahead as a, an estimate and treat people who say they feel strongly about an issue as people who have a directive opinion and people who feel not strongly about an issue people who have a permissive opinion. And the reason that's important is I was trying to estimate what it means when we look at all these health care polls. Okay. <clears throat> Let's get back to the reconciliation procedure in the U.S. Senate. The question was, do you strongly favor, favor, oppose, or strongly oppose the Democrats in the Senate? So, what I was then going to do is say, I'm going to teach those, take those people who strongly favor and strongly oppose as people with a directive opinion, whereas people who moder who just favor, they don't use the word moderately, but that's essentially those who favor oppose, as people who don't have a whimsical opinion, don't really th think about it. So, if you took a look at the overall results as Gallup reported them, they came up with this result: 39% favor and 52% oppose the Democrats using a parliament procedure to avoid a Republican filibuster. Now, we already know that we don't even know if the people understood Republican filibuster. I also know this, that if we said to the question, do you think that bills that are passed in the Senate should be passed by majority vote, or should they be passed 
by a supermajority vote of 60 in order to get passed. We almost surely know that people will set a majority. No, most people don't think, oh, we've got to have 60% to pass something. We all know, a majority, majority wins. So in this case, they, the, to avoid a Republican filibuster was kind of a nasty way of saying, I'm kind of a, I don't think they meant to be biased, but a biased way of asking the question because it, it sounds like Republicans have a right to this filibuster. Well, we know, technically, they don't have a right anymore. It's, it's a right granted by the Senate, which the Senate can take away. It's not in the Constitution. It's nothing like that. It's just a procedural thing. Just like Jim Bunning from Kentucky can hold up all of those appointments. I mean, excuse me, hold up the bills dealing with, um, you know, with uh, temporary job creation. One person in the Senate. And of course, everybody must be walking around. How can one senator do that? Well, it's only because of certain procedures of the Senate, not because they have a right to do it. And if you ask the public what's fair, they probably wouldn't do it. Anyway, that's, that's so that was your first thing. Now, let's suppose we reallocate based upon the strongly and not strongly. What do we find? We find 64% of the public who, in my view, have a permissive opinion. I, I don't know that much about, you know, the filibuster, so on. They can do whatever they want. You find 11% who favor the Democrats' possible use to avoid the filibuster, and 25% who are strongly opposed. And that seemed to me, given, you know, the given the radio, the talk shows, and things like that, that seemed to me more plausible uh, than the, the previous expenditure. So if I'm trying to take a look at what's going on, what public opinion really is, I can't take a look at the polls. The polls, in my sense, are not giving us an accurate picture of what the public is thinking. They are manipulating their own respondents and coming up with opinions that don't, and I think, really reflect what the American public is thinking. Um, so, what about health care polls? <clears throat> most of the health care, just where does it stand? Um, most of the health care questions are from what you have heard or read. Now, here's a way in which the pollsters essentially avoid asking people if they know anything about the Obama health care polls or the Democratic proposals or the Republican proposals. They just say, from what you have heard or read, do you favor or oppose them? You, the thing is that that gives the pollsters data that allow them to have stories, but it doesn't necessarily mean they've done a decent job of trying to figure out what public opinion is all about. So, do the people know anything about any of the specific health care plans? What well, we do know from various polls, you know, if they go down and say, would you favor or oppose this provision, this provision, and all these kinds of the major provisions? Most of the polls suggest that the public supports them. Again, they don't. They just give favor or oppose. They don't say, or don't you have an opinion? So the polls that show people support specific measures are also flawed in the sense that they don't really attempt to find out. But overall, given what we've said, given what's out there, we see this conflict. On the one hand, between the media polls, which say when it comes to the general pro pro problem or the general proposals, they say no, but when it comes to the specifics, they say yes. So what's the, uh, what happens in my view is that the public has a whole lot of views about, or a whole lot of value sets or kind of predispositional ideas that they have, which they bring to the fore when they're asked about health care. In general, people think, the parties should cooperate. So if you see polls that say, should we, should the Re Democrats not go ahead and pass unless they get cooperation from the Republicans, the answer is going to be yes. They think there should be cooperation. They should all, they should work together. Um, they may not know that, after all, Congress is a place where different viewpoints are aired and you know, majority wins and so on. But they just think everybody should work. They also are in favor of helping others. Increased coverage always has a good uh, ring to it. But other kinds of uh, value sets that the American public tends to have, they don't want big government to run it. And if it's viewed as run by big government, then even though people like Medicare, they won't like big government running health care. And they don't 